Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anna Kreit and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, we will have some time to address these questions. So today's speaker is Kuriam Doe, uh, who is an assistant lecturer at the Department of Languages and Literature at Dar es Salaam University College of Education. He is also a PhD student at the University of Dar es Salaam, and he is a junior researcher focusing on morphology and semantics of African languages. So please join me in welcoming Kuria as he gives his presentation today, which is titled uh, Morphosemantic Classification of the Toga Nouns. Yes, uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Kuria Mdoe Michael. I'm a PhD student at the University of Dar es Salaam and a member of the Dalgom project that focuses on the Toga language. Yeah, I'm making a presentation on uh, a morphosemantic classification of the Toga nouns. And in this presentation, uh, I will present the findings of the study. But uh, before presenting the findings of the study, let me start with the study objective and a little bit of uh, background information. Uh, the general objective of this study is that uh, it aims at uh, conducting a morphosemantic analysis and categorization of nouns in the Toga language. Why nouns and why a morphosemantic analysis? Uh, noun have been the field of categorizing nouns in, one, in world languages have been studied and uh, looked at by several scholars. And the results have been, uh, they have been differing. And uh, if I can quote Eichenberg, the year 2000, tells us that the, the, there is a continuum of uh, that uh, all, all bases of categorizing nouns are based, which starts with noun classes and ends with noun classifier. So there are several other things that are involved within that continuum. Uh, so I try to fix the Datoga nouns and see where they will fit in this continuum. Again, the approach towards noun categorization. Various approaches have been used. You can use the mixed one, others have used only a single parameter, either morphological one only, semantic one only, phonological one only. So this study employs a morphological one as well as combining both morphology and semantics in analyzing nouns categorization in the toga. Why morphosemantic categorization or use of the morphosemantic approach? This is because a phonological approach has been applied in the toga noun, in classifying the toga nouns by Rotland and Crader. And again, uh, Kisling has added the aspect of morphology and phonology. And uh, both the scholars are skeptical on the role of semantics in uh, categorizing nouns in the toga. And this way I wanted now, I entered to find how, to see how nouns can be categorized morphosemantically in the toga. And now this way are my other objectives came from. And the objective number one in achieving these, uh, this core activity of categorizing nouns in the toga is identifying the morphology of the toga nouns. Number two is investigating the semantic parameters according to which the toga noun system is organized. And number three, establishing how the extra-linguistic criterion govern the morphosemantics of noun categorization in the toga. This study is guided by the cog cognitive linguistic theory and uh, with, within the, method the methodology, uh, a total of 1,200 common nouns have been corrected and uh, 380 personal nouns have been corrected, which both will be, which both were used 
in the analysis stage of this data and the findings are as shown below. Uh, the findings, not all of them would be presented here, but those that have shown a clear, a clear distinction or a clear picture of how we can categorize nouns in the autogamy for semantically will be greatly focused in here. And to start with, with the findings, the morphology of the toga nouns. To look at the structure of the toga nouns, three structures were identified. And the first structure comprises the stem plus number or the definite marker. And in this, we have, we have an example here of gumeda, gumeda, which becomes gumeka in Turo. So this noun is made of a stem and the number marker here, which is the same in Pluro. Here we have the stem and the number marker. And this noun is for a skeleton and skeletons. So there are several nouns that are made of this structure. That is the stem plus the number or the definite marker. Uh, structure number two is that of the stem plus a formative and a number marker. And this one I've chosen a proto noun that is heaps, where we have apogica, where we have the stem, the formative, and the number marker. And for this, there are also other many nouns with the number with formatives, as well as the stem and the number marker. Structure number three is the prefix followed by a stem and the number marker. So for instance, we have a Gabon Viper. And the Gabon Viper, we have Uda Musheg. Uda Musheg. So we have the prefix Uda and then the stem here and the number marker. So those three are the major structures of the toga nouns that have been established by this study. Uh, when you look at another aspect of productivity and word formation in the toga, we have several word formations that have been identified in this study. And uh, the most common or the most productive ones, we have the derivation morphology, and the compounding. Again, borrowings are a bit productive, though not, they, they are not looked that much into details. Ideophonic formations are not that productive, but there are quite a good number of nouns formed through ideophonic formation, either combined with derivation morphology. So with the derivation morphology, this is one of the productive word formation processes in the toga, which involves both prefixation and suffixation. And with prefixation, it has only been identified with two affixes. And these are the sex marking or sex denoting affixes, the uda, the uda affix, which is either realized as u, ud, and sometimes the vowel assimilates to the vowel or the other sound in the stem, and the gida, which also can be gi or gida, or the vowel can assimilate with sounds present in the stem. Now these affixes are sex denoting, as said earlier, with uda denoting the feminine sex gender, and gida denoting the masculine sex gender. The prefixes are predominantly used in deriving personal names by differentiating the two genders, but they are also used or they have been identified with a set of common nouns in the toga, as it should be shown. They derive nouns from different word categories, thus including then the words categories that they derive from they include nouns, verbs, color terms, idiophonic expression, and compounds with noun noun and verb noun combination. And the, these gender affixes have been found to occupy the prefix position 
and are only identified as prefixes in the Toga nouns. Uh, so fixation in the Toga noun morphology. Uh, these are these an important uh, or these another form of derivation in the Toga, and it involves various morphological formatives that occur after the stem and before the number or the definite marker. And in this study. 14 plural formatives and eight singular formatives have been identified by the study. And uh, with the exception of this formative here, OD formative, OD plural formative, which only combines with the singular chair formative, the other plural formatives select a variety of various singular formatives uh, included. So there is no uniformity or, uh, or a specific pattern that these plural formatives select these singular formatives or these singular formatives correct these plural formatives. There is no any format, but uh, in some scenarios, these suffixes or suffixation or derivation, derivation using the suffixation method has been found to have some semantic roles in classifying the toga now. Now with compounding morphology, this is another productive word formation in the toga. And in these all lexical categories, together with the color terms are part of the compound formation identified in the study. And again, three types of compounds are, have been identified in the study. So the toga has, has exocentric, exocentric and synthetic compounds. And this compound comprise the creative compound class and the non-creative compound class. There is a manuscript that I present later focusing only on this compounding scenario in the toga. Now, if uh, from those kinds of morphology identified, uh, we can now move to towards a classification of the toga nouns. And with this, uh, the study has identified parameters that guide uh, the morphosemantic classification of noun. And parameter number one is the gender classification. Number two, we have color classification. Number three, we have the use of suffix or classifiers. And number four, which in some scenarios supplement the other three, mostly the gender one, is the shape, size, form, and functional similarity classification. Uh, to start with, with gender classification. This gender has been identified as a basis for classifying now. And the study has identified two major ways that gender classification works. And the first way, is either through morphologically marked gender or the unmarked gender. With the marked gender, the classified nouns are morphologically marked with a gender indicating prefix, while the unmarked gender, the classified nouns are not overtly marked with a gender affix, but there exist linguistic as well as extra linguistic evidence that helps in classifying nouns along gender lines. The masculine and feminine gender are the two identifiable genders in the toga nouns. <laughs> and if we look now at the feminine marked classified nouns, these ones are derived using the uda prefix. And in this, the study has identified several nouns from different semantic fields which have been classified using the feminine marker. And these semantic fields include trees and plants, animals, insects, body parts, birds, and weather terms. Uh, to start with, with the trees and plants, here we have You'll forgive me because I've not named the exact trees. This will be done in the coming month. And uh, these trees that we see here, we have a tree called Uchilonga Muhoga, 
udita murjeneda uda bayopta udi igemba ropta this is a mushroom that's everybody i think knows a mushroom and this as we can see we have uda is a, is a synthetic formation this one also is a synthetic formation and this one is another synthetic compound formation so we have here a derivation that uh, in a form of a synthetic compound used to derive nouns these nouns in the toga and uh, for instance if you look at a mushroom there are some form of shape similarity created in a, in a creative manner through that some semantic extension like udi igemba ropta igemba is a shield and ropta is a rain so a mushroom is a shield of rain and then we have uda prefix coming and spreading some semantic information that we shall see in a short while so that's the that's the semantic field of plants and trees again we have some animals that were identified with these markers as shown below we have uda gumalda these are tortoise uda ngushek that's a gabon vipe and udo a hippo what we can see is that these animals are of small or short size are slow and not that much dan dangerous especially the gabon viper and some are noisy so these characteristics of these animals we have short size short in size are slow and not that da dangerous if we can go back here and see the types of tree a, ma a mushroom is small again this tree here uh provides it's a small one and provides shade to calves or lambs animals that don't go far away for grazing and young ones of animals that don't go far away for grazing so they sleep under the shade of this tree so we can see here also the essence of small in size and uh, such thing in class you classified using the other prefix if now we can go to the insects and birds the common characteristics of these classified nouns include small size attractiveness the importance of product as well as noise and here we have a bat udagashko here we have another synthetic compound formation udawang crane bird Udagu, a raven, and these ones here are formed through a derivation called formation joined together with a, an idiophonic expression. Wang and gu are idiophonic expression from the sound made by these two birds. And Uda came but they read a butterfly. So these we have, they are small in size, they are noisy and such things. Uh, for the body parts they were directly associated with women for example an anchor is called uda awar kadem so we have weather terms we have the likes of uda guengda shegi a rainbow here having a uh, 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 another synthetic formation uda omuguti and uda guru sagenda stratocellus crown and cirrus crown and this rainbow here is associated with attractiveness with the two crowds color and how they easily disappear in the sky and make them fall into this classification. Therefore, as shown from those, uh, the feminine affix semantically realizes several meanings, including small size, weak, less dangerous, noisy, attractive, source of comfort, and variable social brew, and other female related nouns such as uncle and close female friends. Now, if we turn to the masculine gender, if we turn to the masculine gender affix this is another category in which marked gender is shown in the toga like the feminine marked nouns there exists a class of masculine marked the toga nouns they are morphologically marked using the gida suffix the masculine marker is identified with nouns from different semantic fields that include production and tools containers and utensils people and animal diseases as well as people and some abstract nouns.
uh, and an example generally we have such diseases are like pneumonia cattle anthrax people include iron smelters abstract nouns and male readership containers we have uh, a gesuda equivalent this is a container in women room where urine and some other things are kept tools we have a cut jembe for drilling holes and then we have a factory so in general this gida prefix is associated with nouns that are of male sphere activities large production area killer and life social threatening animal and people diseases containers of bigger size as well as high pitch sounds so those are the two sex denoting suffixes which classified nouns in the toga through a gender marked classification now the unmarked gender here we have various sets of nouns that can be classified along gender lines although they are not over three marked for gender here we have animals are classified along gender lines which this is supported through naming as well as other social factors attributed to the animals from the study big less attractive dangerous and negatively connotated animals such as elephant lion buffalo donkey dogs are classified as masculine animals while attractive and small animals such as cat monitor lizard giraffe are associated with the feminine gender this has been supported by the naming strategy in the toga as we shall see as well as other extra linguistic factors identified by the study and supported by other scholars including Ilma 1964 another dis distinction that elucidates the unmarked gender is the male female sphere categorization of the toga now this is greatly influenced by the toga people culture which identifies each gender with exclusive spheres of social political and economic activities this has as well been supported by naming of newborns where some names reflect spheres specific to a given gender this we shall see it when we shall come to the personal names to be clear since also here we have issues like councils dances ornaments are divided along gender lines they are nouns associated with the male sphere only war and war equipment honey brew and brewing hunting are all masculine nouns related to household work plus nouns related to cooking are associated with the feminine sphere hence feminine nouns so in this category of nouns oh uh, such words if we can give examples here there are some words which have a gender have two gender distinct meaning for example we have a living room a bed and containers among others so for instance a bed in male's room will remain a place for sleeping but a bed in a female room has added connotation related to fertility and procreation and is well guarded and protected area these findings are supported in my study and again was seen by Bristed 2000 who focus on procreation uh, a study on procre an et ethno ethnocultural study but also supported these findings and again a heath in a male and women's room have different meanings they have they are the same thing but depending on where they are on these two different spheres they they get different meanings Let's come to color classification of nouns. And with this color classification, the toga has a spectrum of color, although this one is not exhaustive. So you have a black, shining, white, brackish or brownish, greenish, grayish, reddish, pale, all these are colors. And in these, we have nouns that are related to such colors. They are categorized using the color term. For instance, we have brackish nouns. We have like safari ant, nimbus crowd, and lake basotu. And here, this is the color. Here we have the color, and here we have the col the black color. And a wish color. We have here an itch on the body, 
name of a lake and also a cow with this color. So there are so many, each color derives a group of nouns that are related to that color. I'll show some the extents in, in a certain extent as an element of that color. Uh, the suffix of formative classifiers, this one, we shall only look at two for the time being. And uh, we have the Odiga formatives. This one classifying agentive nouns derived from verbs, abstract nouns, and which have a singular formative term. And for instance, here we have Gawis Jochenda in singular and Gawis, Gawisa Jodiga. These are milka. And the source is kawa to milk. And then we have Gnelsho Chenda coming to Gnelsho Dika. Here we have instructor coming from instruct. We have Rino Chenda coming from Rino Jika since. So that is one classifying such nouns, such agentive nouns. Then we have Tika Puro classifiers. This is another identified plural formative with classifying law. And this has been seen, it's only in the plural form, and has been seen to occur with nouns with the following features. It is associated with them, long artifacts, hollow objects, and viscous liquids that too can be compared to thin long artifacts through extension. Some of the nouns have an opening or require an opening for them to be released. The liquids are associated with forming wrong projection when they are released. Some examples are here. We have the maggots, the maggots, pass, honey harvesting bag, a hole or opening, and we also have sweat. This is the formative. In this noun, kawotka. Sewutka, Sherutka, Buruditka, and Kugutka. So these are some of the examples or nouns with some semantic similarities derived using the T formative, which can now be termed as a classifier. If we go to the personal nouns, uh, these personal nouns, the meaning of newborns in the toga reflects activities taking place during birth, the nature of labor, parent or child behavior or the appearance of the child or the parent during birth. So in deriving the names of the newborns, we have the various morphological procedures are involved. And some of the procedures are the derivation using the gender marking prefixes, zero derivation or conversion, compounding, color term derivation and borrowing. Uh, the zero derivation, not the zero derivation, the derivation using the gender affixes. For instance, we have the charoda from the word charoda, that meant bond outside. Uta gejeta, born during the third famine. Uda shows or gashos, pass in between something born in between maybe a mountain and gidahuta or gidahut from the from derived from the verb kahut which means lose something so this gida uda uda gida we have uh, the affixes deriving the personal nouns we have zero derivation personal nouns so we have a name like jaledi derived from jaled, which is quarrel, udagwandu, derived from a monkey, guenga, derived from a bell, gafufen, derived from exhausted, leku, derived from weakening, and the likes. Again, we have naming from negation. We have merekwa, from the verb rekwa, to mean one who is not shaved, mefufa, from the verb fufa, one who doesn't rest, mefunya, from the word funya, one who wasn't hidden, and Malena from the from the Bableku, who one who isn't weak. 
Another one is naming from color terms. We have Duseni, we have the color Du, Gita Fafi, we have Fafi, a pale color, and the likes, the others there are as shown on their colors. Again, we have compounding, like Tamuhoga, that's mouth and curves, Barmeida, Boashgeda, Mekalos, these are examples of personal names formed through compounding, and uh, they are as shown there. Borrowed personal names, we have borrowed mostly from Swahili and English. So we have Uda Gijiko from Kijiko, a spoon in Swahili, Mnati from Nada auction, Gida Muchurusi from Churusi, a middleman. We have like Mutuku, Uda Mutuku from Mamotoka, Darakta from Tractor, we have Gida Rakta. So they are personal names from, from borrowing. And the, these names we shall see also varies which one should be given to a lady and which one should be given to a male newborn. So we have gender, how is gender differentiated in that other name? So all genders take animal names, but the type of animal differs. The animals, it has been found that animals that are big, ugly, and dangerous are associated with masculine names while small, attractive, and docile animals are associated with feminine names as shown below. So these, all these on here, a leopard, hyena, buffalo, lion, a type of eagle that is dangerous, these one are associated with male names. But these one, other animals, a monkey and a stretch and a small type of bird, they're not dangerous and they are small, so they are associated with the feminine gender. So that's one and it support the unmarked gender categorization of other nouns too, as we saw earlier. Again, we have along social activities. There are some social activities that are specific for women. For instance, milking, to smear a house with mud, to cook, to a spoon, a kitchen, and skinning. These are female-related activities, and it's only female newborns that can be named from these activities. So these are evidence of categorizing things according to the each gender spheres of activities. Again, we have the male activities here, like hunting. We have a bow. We have the activity of sharpening an arrow at the end. We have these related to drinking and honey brew because women are not supposed to drink in the Datoga culture. So you cannot name a, 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 a female newborn to things related to these because they are only for the male. So they are male related activities and it's only male who are born during these activities that can be named after these activities. Again, gender differentiation along meaning connotation. So names with negative connotations are only given to masculine newborns. So we have uh, Emunyind, that's Ubaya. We have Maasai to diarrhea, bed without buttocks. All these have a negative connotation in the toga and they are given to male newborns. But those with the positive connotation, on the other hand, have been found to be given to female newborns. So for example, Manang, small but good. Udaminga, a star. Somebody charming will be called Udabonga, but will never have Gidabonga. Udabunda, Bunda, extra beautiful. So we have and again, Uda Bubuni, a soft skinned. So a newborn, even if it's a male with a soft skin, cannot be called Gida Bubun because this word has a positive connotation and they are only associated with female gender. Another one is uh, names associated with brutal people. If we can start with these ones here, we have Gitigen, the German rulers. Mkari, this was a DC who harshly punished the Datoga. 
and Mutresi, these were post-independent police who also dealt harshly with the Datoga people and the police themselves, these borrowed from Swahili. All these are masculine names and they cannot be associated with the female, or they cannot be given to female newborns. And when, even when, if these, for these examples here, when a female is born in a scenario that is not attractive, or for example, in a bungeda, or when someone has died, or, or when animals are dying, we have other strategies like negation and compounding are used to avoid the naming of female new, these female newborns. So we can have udamekwa, not covered, or udamerekwa, not to be shaved, or udamenase, one who brought bad news, to, to signify that event, but not directly, but through, through other linguistic means. So generally, what we have seen there, there is a there is a clear categorization of nouns in the toga through gender lines, which can be either be marked or unmarked. The unmarked one has been supported by as as, as it was shown with the common nouns, the naming system has clearly supported these findings. So so far so good. These are some of the findings is still the preliminary findings. Much of the discussion will come in the next episode of the presentation of the final document. But as for now, that's the presentation. The end, in the toga we say, Badis Choda, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for this presentation, Gloria. Uh, I think we can now begin with the question and answer section. So if anyone would like to ask a question or offer a comment, please do so using the chat module. Uh, I will start with my own question to give other participants some time to write. Um, I, my question is about the personal names which are derived from the uh, color terms. Uh, maybe I missed it, but uh, are those usually associated with male or female gender? Uh, because as far as I could see, they were not associated with gender prefixes. You said personal names associated with? Yeah, with the color terms. Um, and oh, oh, with, the, yeah, with the color terms, okay, thank you. Uh, if I can answer, they, they are not directly associated, they are not marked, but they are unmarked in that uh, colors that, are, that seem to be inattractive are associated uh, with uh, male gender, but colors that are to them, to the Datoga culture, seem to be attractive like white or shining uh, associated with the female gender. So that's a, that's a, there, there's some, those are some of the cultural things that uh, they, they kind of relate them to attractive them. So there is an issue of attractiveness that guides the naming of the newborns. Okay, thank you. Um, then I see that there's a whole bunch of questions or comments in the chat module. So I'll start with the first one from Bunny. He um, has three questions. The first one is, um, is the word uh, gumeda, um, does the formative a indicate number and suffix da indicate specificity definiteness? Since Roland Kiesling has given such an analysis, what is your stand now? Okay, okay, in the word gumeda, does the formative A indicate number and suffix? Uh, since Roland Kissing has given such analysis, uh, for the time uh, as of now, uh, I see that uh, this A is not a formative, rather becomes part of the suffix, because if we change it from gumeda, or we ask which skeleton, the, the A still remains. So in, in such a scenario, I find this to, to be part of the STEM. Okay, thank yeah. you. Then I'll move on to his second question, which says, yeah. in your data, the masculine Gida and the feminine Ura is very open, but I fail to see neuter nouns. Is that the unmarked nouns indicate neuter nouns? Uh, yeah, the, the, I, I had such an idea of having a, the, the neuter nouns, but they're not these ones that are not marked. 
rather there are some uh, there are some nouns which are few for example if i can i can provide animals through the naming of newborns we can have a noun like a giraffe now this giraffe i can call it a neuter i can term it a neuter noun because it can take it can take either a feminine noun or a or a feminine newborn or a male newborn and again it is supported in the issue of attractiveness, it falls to the feminine gender, but it's bigger in size. So the size also makes it fall to the masculine gender. So there is a kind of, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm still discussing this on data from other fields and what other scholars say, but uh, there appears to be a class of new nouns, but uh, are then not associated to those unmarked nouns. They are unmarked nouns that are purely gendered all right uh, i think it sort of follows up on his third question i wonder whether the bed in male house slash room uh, bears the gita prefix and in the female house slash room contains the uda prefix yeah uh, yeah with these ones uh in the datoga way of life uh the bed in the male room uh, they, they, they don't they don't have the, the 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 sex denoting markers, but rather what they have is a meaning differentiation. In that the bed in the male's loom cannot be used for other functions, but the bed in female's room is the one that accommodates the procreation and the birth process and all those other things related to procreation and uh, they are done in the female bed so there are other connotations added to the female bed unlike this one unlike a male bed which is only for for the for the for the male for the male people in the datoga society or, or in the datoga homestead they use that room but for the female one it has some other added connotation and other added social values that too contribute to its meaning this has also been supported by bristad 2000 in her in her study so that's the case it's an, an, an unmarked gender okay thank you then i'm gonna move on to a comment from richard uh, he says um that he has a short comment about the masculine gender prefix gida this prefix might be related to a word gida meaning something like thing, which is found in Asimyeik Datoga and is used in associative construction set as um, Git Madit, the first thing. Yeah, I, I, I concur with him in that uh, these, two, these two sex denoting suffixes, they come, they, where they originate from, for the example, Uda originates from the name Huda to mean a girl child. But Gida originates from a thing, a thing. So I concur with him that this Gida is not directly related to 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 a male gender like like the one of that female which comes directly from the word Huda already, but this one comes from Gida or Gid, which is a thing. That one I concur with him, and I'm happy for that. Okay, thank you. Then I will move on to Roland Kiesling. He says, thank you for this nice overview and the rich data you presented. Um, he says, you seem to derive gender categorization of all the Toga nouns which are not marked with either Uda nor Gida for their potential to derive personal names with either Uda or Gida. I was wondering how you account for the doublets, um, for example, those which have the potential to derive both male and female na names. Uh, mm, with this one, that's a, that's a, a, I'm, I'm feeling like I should come with not feeling. I'm like trying to make an argument that I should come with a neuter gender, but I'm still consulting my findings, as well as visiting other sources, and I'll see. Yeah, there are some there are some of the nouns that kind of uh, they can be associated with both genders, but again, I'm looking at the other forms of classification of classifiers like uh, like the the formative they call car with or maybe they are related to color terms or they are related to something else 
because out of gender, there are other criteria of categorizing nouns or other parameters that are used in categorizing nouns. So I'm still working around that thing. Then at the end of the day, I will come up with, a, do we have a, a, a feminine, a masculine, and a neuter gender, or are they accounted for by other forms of crime? Okay, uh, he goes on to say uh, that he has a remark about terminology, uh, taking up Amani's point. So in the example Apojiga, what do you identify as formative? So for example, G, and he says, I would rather identify OG. Definitely seems to have a plural meaning as well, since it contrasts with Apeda as a singular. Um, of course, you're right that the suffixes da and ga contain number notions conflated with definiteness or specificity or something yeah. of that kind. But I think there's a layer of suffixes before that which indicate number without any reference to definiteness. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 grateful for this for this comment here, because as I said earlier, there are there are 14 plural formatives and 18 singular formative. As of now, the ones that have clearly identified to have clear semantic uh, functions are uh, only for the plural ones there are only two the other three they kind of show the others that have not classified they kind of show a semantic uh, reality or a semantic kind of classification but again you find there are some other nouns still with the same with the same kind of uh, taking the same formative but when i try to establish the semantic motivation i, I, I it, it becomes a little bit uh, problematic. And that's why I see, I, I still consult my data and my informants and then come up to see whether these other formatives, including G, whether it has some other, other, other roles too. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I, I can also see this by Kisling, uh, the motivation from uh, the, the story that we had somewhere about the girls and uh, yeah. That's a, it's a kind of a, mytholo a mythological association, which in one way or the other comes as a support of some other extra linguistic factors that contribute to the, to the categorization of nouns into, in the toga, into the gender terms, in support of, uh, of uh, the gender and the masculine or the gender or the female or feminine and masculine classification. So this mythological classification, and I, I'm, I'll be grateful because soon we shall meet and we shall propound on that thing of the extra linguistic factors because I've not talked much about it here. Thank you. Um, for the people watching the YouTube video, I will just read out the comment from Kiesling as well. So uh, what you just discussed was uh, his remark about motivation of hippo being assigned to female Uda um, yeah. is based on there is, as you might remember, a myth about hippos stemming from girls which have been cursed by a great Tatoga myth mythological ancestor. Yeah. Um, then I think we're going to go to our last question, which is by Karani, who mm -hmm. asked what are possible strategies to indicate uh, slash denote cuteness or little and nice looking masculine names, let's say for animals or boys, as opposed to negative or bad looking entities. Yeah, the, the, these, uh, what I can say is that uh, all things that are attractive are associated with the with the with the with the with the feminine marker, and uh, th those others that are that, that don't look attractive. So the criteria of attractiveness uh, is a bit I cannot say slippery, but uh, to them there are things that are attractive and others that are not attractive, and they clearly decipher that. They clearly decipher that that this are, these are attractive and this one is not attractive. But uh, the attractive things, they are only associated with the feminine marker, and the less attractive one are associated with the with the with the with the male sex denoting prefix. Uh, to follow up on that, can I ask? So, for example, I think an animal which was masculine was like lion, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what if I want to say, oh, that's a very cute little lion. Is that possible? In, uh, it's not possible because at the end of the day, they take it as a whole, that a lion as a lion at the end of the day is a dangerous animal. It will attack their source of living, which is the cattle and kill the cattle. 
So they never take whether it's a female one, it's a young one. So anything called the lion will remain to be masculine because of its essence of being a dangerous animal. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think those were all the questions and comments for today. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that the recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Uh, looking ahead, the next presentation will be given on Wednesday, February 12th by Joseph Okororo Ismail and it's titled Problems of Tone Assignment in Yatuo with special reference to super highs and super lows. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you again for this very interesting presentation and of course everyone else for participating today and I hope to see you again at our next webinar. <laughs>